Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Dionysius, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. God separated me from alcohol uh, on March 31st of 2014. I, I celebrated eight years of sobriety uh, very recently. I'm, I'm still celebrating that, uh, and I'm currently sitting in my... I'm currently sitting in my office as an assistant principal of a, of a high school here in New York City. And, um, you know, about 10 years ago, I got fired as a school teacher. And, uh, you know, whatever, 10 years later, you know, God has fully restored me to default factory setting. Uh, and when I say I'm a recovered alcoholic and God has restored me, I don't take that lightly. And, I, and I'd like to tell you exactly what that means. And I also think it's really important to talk a little bit about uh, the, the steps, not a little bit, everything about the steps. And I think it's really nice that you read the steps. And so I'd like to, exper- I'd like to share my experience, strength, and hope with the steps and the big book, uh, the, the book, and I, I brought my little one with me today. And the book tells us to, to um, share exactly what happened to you, to express the spiritual feature freely. And it says to tell the newcomer and just the fellow, the fellows themselves, your fellows themselves, what your life was like what happened and what your life is like now. And I, I set off a little bit. I set off my talk just in there because I'm, I'm, sitting in my, I'm sitting in my office. I'm sitting in my office, a successful man, a successful man of God, a, a, a man who no longer is addicted to drugs and alcohol, a man who is no longer a prey to misery and depression, a man who no longer is useless to others, a man who no long, who no long, who no longer is dominated by his emotions. I, I have been set free and I've been set free through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the 12 steps and which are found in the big book, in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I experienced a, a spiritual awakening and I continue to experience spiritual experiences as a result of the design for living that I was thrust into when I entered into Alcoholics Anonymous. And so that happened eight years ago when I was a completely broken man. Uh, You know, I I, I, I wanna go back and just tell you a little bit about what my life is like now, and then I'm gonna go back a little bit more because it's important to really drive home to the newcomer. If you don't believe me already, like I'm a fall down, blackout, abusive, suicidal, homicidal drunk. Today, I, I, oh, I, I am an assistant principal. Today, I'm a homeowner. Today, I'm a, 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 a decent son, a good brother, a, a great neighbor, a, a good friend, a good human being. And that was not the case. Today, uh, you know, we should share these things. Today, I have money in the bank. Today, I don't have financial insecurities. I mean, these are part of the the promises that our program offers us. Uh, Today, I don't have to call myself a liar and a cheater. Today, I am healthy. I'm like physically healthy. Um, today I have friends today. I have people who rely upon me. I have friends and family who rely upon me. I have professional colleagues who rely upon me. I have over 400 students who rely upon me. And this was not the case 
this was not what my life was like. I was a broken man who was addicted to alcohol and drugs. I was in, uh, I was the toxic part of toxic relationships. I was a manipulator and an abuser. Uh, I was physically violent. I was verbally abusive. I was controlled and alcohol was my master. Now, you know, you know, I could tell you a little bit about the drinking, but I don't think that that's really what people come to hear. People want to hear about the solution. And so let's start with, let's start with step one. I mean, Kate, you're right. Step one is, right, like my life is, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. You know, and what's important about step one is that there are there are two parts to step one, and they're even separated by this hyphen. Life is unmanageable, powerless over alcohol, and life is unmanageable. The first part was pretty hard for me, this powerless part. The second part, it was pretty easy to accept that because I was medically extremely ill. Uh, I was financially in ruins. I was emotionally bankrupt and spiritually devoid. So, you know, in the recesses of my, my pretty bankrupt and void soul, I could easily admit that yeah, I'm not really doing good at this life thing. It's just not working for me. Now, the powerless part, you know, we alcoholics, addicts, our it tells us in our book, it tells us that the great obsession of every addict, of every alcoholic is that we're not alcoholic, is that we will control and manage our situation. And so, you know, at a certain point, I was broken. And we all hit our rock bottom. And whatever that may be, it is the blessing and the grace of God that allows us to get to a rock bottom place without dying that gives us the opportunity to build ourselves up. And so, you know, think about your rock bottom as the, you know, the bedrock, the foundation of a brand new life. We don't think of it at that exact time. But that's exactly what it is. And that's what it was for me. Now we go on to step two, and we start to think about, well, I came to believe that a power greater than myself. Listen, I mentioned spiritually bankrupt, morally bankrupt, have no true God in my life, have no true faith system in my life. But I wanted... I really, all I really wanted was, was to get the heat off. I was married at the time. I wanted my wife to let me back in the house. She had kicked me out. I wanted to just kind of get my old life back. And so I had been going to AA meetings, uh, you know, for a while. I had been going and showing up drunk and sitting in the corner and not talking to anybody and just kind of scoffing, right? Because it tells us we once came to scoff and then we eventually came, stayed and prayed. But the more I would sit around and I would look and I would see people, right? Like the book says, fresh skinned and glowing, Guy shows up in a suit talking about how he he's an assistant principal and, and how he used to how he was a fire teacher who used to be drunk all the time. My ears pick up a little bit. They perk and they say, what? Or somebody says, like, you know, like I was an abusive man and like I would end up in psychiatric units and I like I ended up in jail. And like nobody like who would show up at a place and tell and divulge these types of secrets to to a group of strangers so my second step experience is essentially is the group is the fellowship right that's really where my second step experience was founded and grounded in because i would look around again people fresh skinned and fresh skinned and glowing just like like bill talks about in his story and i said maybe there is a way now, there's a, little, there, there's a lot more to a second step experience. I remember when I was actively going through the steps in step two, uh, which really there's not much, there is no action in step two. It's just this like feeling. It's just this idea. 
idea, it's just an overwhelming sentiment. But I can remember being super, super depressed, super down, super scared, super like financially in dire straits, walking. And I remember being up on this hill or like this park. And I remember thinking like, oh, God or universe, spirit, whatever it was that I was thinking it was at the time. I said, oh, if you're there, like blow, bl blow on my face, like put the wind on my face. I'm sitting on top of a hill. I, of course, I'm going to feel some sort of breeze, but it was really a decision. And that decision to come to believe, it leads us into our third step decision and to our third step. And this is where things get really serious in our program, by the way. This can't be done alone. Now, originally, it was done alone, right? We would print these books, and we would send them out, and people would read them, and people would go through them. And so, you know, if you are really into the program, and you're into the text, and you're into the literature, you know, you could say, well, it can be done. And so I will agree with you, it can be done. But we're living in 2022. And we're surrounded by a fellowship of individuals who have had, who have been, who have been released from active addiction. You might as well get somebody's help. And so it's really important to mention that somebody, a sponsor, guided me through the steps out of the book. All right. And so when I made this decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, as I understood him, it's essentially the beginning of a prayer life. You know, I, this is the broken elevator group. Like it's clearly about taking the steps, but the word broken is super important because we become broken humans. We're not working anymore. It's not going well. And so, you know, we get pushed to a place of being forced to try something new. And so prayer became a part of my life in the third step. And so I was, I was told very, I was given very simple directions. I was not living in the house that I was, I was living in. I was kicked out. I was sleeping at my mother's apartment. I was staying at my friend's apartment. I was sleeping on this air mattress at this place, at this sofa bed, at this other place. But in all of these different locations, I would get up in the morning and I would hit my knees and I would ask God to keep me away from a drink today. And I would tell God, whatever that God was at the time, because it wasn't a firm understanding of God, I would say, God, I'm going to check in with you throughout the day. And at the end of the day, I would hit my knees again and I would thank God for just one day sober. That was it. That was my third step. Now, there was another part of doing the third step as it's outlined in the book. I remember getting on my knee when I officially did it. I got on my knees. I held the hands of my sponsor. And it says, and, you know, I, you know forgive me if I'm not, like, exactly quoting, but it says, like, a, a feeling, a, an extreme feeling was felt at once. I, listen, someone's coming to clean my office. I'm going to mute and tell them that I'm not available. Hold on. So, sorry. Um, anyway, oh, my God. Third step. Yeah, so, like, a feeling was felt at once. And here's something else I want to tell you about the third step. It tells us in the book that the wording was um, optional, Right, because the, the the language that's in the text is really Bill Wilson's language, and that's his third step. And so part of the activity, part of the lesson for me was to write my own third step. Now, of course, I, I use Bill Wilson's as a as a sample, you know, the art thou, there are, you know, I was told like, you know, we don't really talk that way anymore. Like, but the you know, in one, two, and in three. We're really getting right with God. That's what one, two, and three is all about. Those are the steps. It's getting right with God. And so, you know, I started to just uh, think about, write about, what did I think God was? If I could create a God, what would that God be? 
And the word loving came up for me. Like, that's what I wanted God to be. And so, you know, I, I also, getting back to what the text tells us in that the wording was optional, that I wrote my own third step. It was very much similar, but it's the same third step that I say every single morning to this day. Right? It essentially says what we prayed at the beginning of this meeting. God, I'm not in control. You are. My way of doing things doesn't really work. Your way, your will is going to do better. It's been doing better day by day. And again, like I'm just going to try it your way because my way does not work. Protect me, please. Thank you. That's essentially kind of what, what we got going on there. And then we go to like this fourth step, right? And the fourth step is, is powerful. It says, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Now, fourth step is, is the program, right? The whole program is the program, but the fourth step, it brainwashes us. It washes our brain. You can quote me. I guess I'm being recorded. Our brains are dirty, they are ruined. They are not working well. When I was active and I would go to meetings, I would say, oh, I don't need brainwashing and these Jesus freaks and this and that. No, actually, you do, right? So in the beginning of our text, the text spends a lot of time essentially asking or answering two questions. What is alcoholism and what's an alcoholic? because we don't really understand what these things are. And again, that, that leads us to this compulsion that we're not, this obsession that, no, 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 we're not. That's why step one is like, you've got to eliminate all doubts in your head that you can control and manage your own life. So, you know, for, step four is a rewiring of the way we think. It's probably, there's probably some like neuroplasticity going on there. You're like, we could do a study. I don't really know, but let's get to what it says. And it's gut wrenching. But if you do it as outlined, and if you do it with someone who is, who is going to do it with you uh, prayerfully and quickly and thoroughly, no time to waste, you will make a list of your resentments institutions, places, ideas. You will make a list of your, of your fears. You will make a list of your harms to others. You will make a list of your sexual harms. And then you will go through these lists, these people, institutions, and ideas. And then you will kind of ask yourself, what parts of the, my ego, of, of me, of my persona, was this effect, did this affect, right? And then you're going to get to this place. Then you're going to get to a place in what I call 4.4. Well, I, don't know. I, mean, I just call it 4.4, but it's really like the fourth part of each column where it asks you to look at your part. What part did you play? How did you get the ball rolling? Right? Where did you cause your own trouble? Because we become, we are the people on page 62. I'm selfish and self-centered. That is the root of my problem. See, this program, the literature, the book, right? Not, there's three parts, right? There is the unity, which is the recovery. This is, there's unity, which is the fellowship, right? Um, there is the, there's the service, which is what we're doing here. What the, what the servants do by putting this meeting together, the individuals who submit two bucks to Venmo, the people who greet you, the people who manage the, the chat, but really the part of that triangle, gosh, I probably have it right here. Right? The bottom part of that is the recovery. And that is the 12 steps. And so, you know, when you get, when you go through that process of resentments and fears and harms and sexual harms, and you look closely and someone holds you to the fire and you write down, what part did you play? Where are you to blame? We become, we start to become different. Now, 
we are never going to be uh, rendered white as snow, I think it says in some of our other literature, without God's, without God's consent, without God's permission, without God's help. And we'll probably never stay clean forever and ever, or not clean from drugs, but just like clean from fears and resentments and harms. But it is a, the beginning of a new way of living. And we learn that in step four. Most people never get to step four. And it's so important. You know, whenever I talk, I, I'm talking, I'm really just thinking all the time, like, listen, man, if you're not through the steps, find someone who's been through the steps, find someone who's talking about the book all the time, find someone who's talking about God all the time and get your life together and let God get your life together because we can't do it. It tells us if you could quit upon a non-spiritual basis, you are not one of us. You're welcome here, but you are not the real alcoholic, right? What is alcoholism? What is an alcoholic? And so what is alcoholism? It's just three-part disease. The book really focuses on two most of the time and secretively but underscoringly talks about the third part, which is where I fully came in. But it talks about the allergy. It talks about the physical compulsion to drink. When I drink, when I drug, I can't stop. I'm sober eight years. I hang out with people who drink. Alcohol is not the problem. I love watching people drink, especially regular drinkers. It reminds me I'm a sick puppy because I'm like, how did you just stop? Like, why would you go home now? Like, go all the way. Like, finish that bottle and get another one, right? So, number one, physical compulsion. I can't stop. Two, mental obsession. The mental obsession is like all over the place. It tells you like, one, you don't have a problem. Two, other people's problems with you are the problem. If you would get rid of them, then the problem would be removed. Uh, three, like, uh, I, I, wish you could I wish I could tell you what I used to look like. And it's not just like more pounds on me. Like my eye was bugged, like, literally bulging out of my head. My thyroid was completely out of whack. I was going to die. And my brain told me, you know, you're fine. That's the mental obsession. Mental obsession tells me she's never going to leave you because she loves you. <laughs> he's never going to leave you. He loves you too much. Like he's going to put up with it. She's going to just like accept this for what it is. Mental obsession is sick. But the, the third part of alcoholism is the spiritual malady. I talked about the spiritual malady when I came, when I started. Page 52, those the, the, the bedevilments, right? A prey to misery and depression, not of use to anyone. I couldn't control my emotional nature. Like my constitution, who I was fundamentally on the inside was so warped. But that's not who we are from birth. And that's what the program does. It brings us back to our default setting. But you're never going to get there unless you go through the steps, unless you fully, prayerfully, and thoroughly, and quickly re become reborn. And in third, the third step, it says that we become reborn. So it's like you're off. One, two, three, God. So I talked about the fourth step. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is really where we, I forget, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, we get right with ourself, right? We're figuring out again who we become, who are we, who were we designed to be? Maybe we've never even actualized that when we were like when we were actively drinking or drugging or before that. Maybe we have so many like life early traumas that just busted us up. And then we turn to the drink and to the drug to mask all of that. But my but again, like like that spiritual malady piece is so big because like that's for me, it was big. Because I, I, st 
still just wouldn't wrap my head around the fact that I that I couldn't drink regardless if I wanted to or not. Like rather, I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. And the the mental thing, I thought I was like smarter than anybody in the world. I mean, that's still my character flaw. But when someone said, "Look at what, look at page fifty-two, are you that person?" It was undeniable. You know, I was just at a meeting talking about step five, admitted to God, to ourselves, to another human being, the exact nature of our wrong. Listen, step five is actually much simpler than people make it out to be. This is that we are liars and we don't want to tell people our lies, right? The alcoholic more than most lead a double life. We will do anything for you not to know about it. You want me to tell somebody? You must be crazy. No, yes, exactly. You and God, the other good book tells us that when you come together, God is there. The point of the fifth step is to take a flashlight and to look at those at that work that you wrote down, that you put pen to paper and is to look at like, all right, so let's look at these resentments. All right, let's look at your part in these resentments. All right, talk to me about the fears. Let me see what, what, let's take a look at your parts in the fears. Okay, the harms, you you like to steal money, you like to rob people, you like to like, you know, like, shoot. I was like a master at uh, like returning things to Costco, like, because Costco has like this, you know, ridiculously lenient uh, return policy. And so I would buy things because I was broke. I was spending all my money in drugs and alcohol. And I would like return, buy stuff like food and return half of it. I like this stealing, I was stealing. Like these are the things that I was doing. Um, so the fifth step is essentially running through that. And you might not know as the alcoholic, as the recovering individual, what's happening, but someone who has recovered should know that we're looking for patterns of your defects and your faults that add to your spiritual malady, that add to your discon- your restlessness, irritability, and discontentment with life. Again, spiritual malady. And it's essentially to walk away from this saying and feeling, right? You don't have to be that person again. That's step five. Right. You know, it's funny because like, I still hear this a lot. I now identify with more than ever. I used to hear it earlier, like people pleasing. Listen, that's what, like, that's what I do. I will do anything for people to like me to the point where people don't like me. It's a little weird. It's a little, it's a little complicated. You could talk all another 50 minute talk about that, but I will do anything for people to like me to the point where they don't like me. All right. That's my life. That is my cycle. That is my, what I learned about myself in the fifth step. And then the sixth step, right? It says, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Well, I just talked about these things. This is how I've been living my life for an extremely long time. How am I supposed to change that? I couldn't change that. I couldn't even stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop stealing money from my life partner, from my wife. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop showing up to drunk work. Drunk work, work drunk. I couldn't stop doing it. How am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to? No, you're not supposed to. Six step asks one question, three words. Are you in are you into this program because you've come pretty far actually you're kind of halfway in are you in because now we're gonna rock and roll with god because god if you're in your sixth step you have been set free if, I think it's going to even say like somewhere, like you're going to start to have a spiritual experience at this point, right? After the fifth step, it says you will feel light. You will be a new human being. Every, by the way, every single step comes with promises. We've got to study the book. The literature tells us this. By the way, also like 
this book, I mean, this is, is, di is divinely inspired and humanly penned. This is, for, this is a gift from God for us unique individuals. Alcohol saved my life. I'll say that again. It saved me. Because if it weren't for alcohol, if it weren't for drugs, I would have never found God. Number seven, humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. See, in our text, six and seven take up half of one page in two short paragraphs. I'm not going to make a mistake because, you know, I'm not going to tell you like, oh, page one to 23, 23 to 46, this and that. I'm not going to tell you about all this, but it spends tremendous amount of time telling you about alcoholism, about this, about this, about other parts of the program, of the steps. And then it gets to six and seven, and it gives you one page and it gives you two, half of one page and two paragraphs. And look, I can only share, I, I freely given, freely shared. I simply, I was told that it's by the, but when you get into six and seven, it is God who is doing the work. Prayer. Started in three, probably started in step zero, right? Get me out of this one. Keep me alive. Please don't let my, please don't let my heart explode from all the cocaine I just sniffed. Please, uh, like, please take those pains in the side of my body away. I think my liver is like shutting down. Those are, those are step zero prayers, right? Like, oh my God, like, like get me out of the psychiatric unit, Step zero prayers. Step one prayer for me, get me back into the house, uh, make that check come faster. Uh, please don't let me get caught walking away from the drug spot. Right? Please don't let me get arrested. Those are step, <laughs> those are step zero and one prayers. You know, step three prayers, keep me, keep me, you know, step two prayers, keep me away from a drink and a drug today. Thank you. Step three, God, I can't, you can, I'm going to let you. Step four, pray, 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 pray. Please remove this resentment against this person from my life because of this reason. God, please remove this fear that doesn't allow me to think this way about this scenario. God, please allow that person to forgive me for the harm that I've done. Pray. Pray, pray. This is a program of prayer, faith, and works. Right on time for step number eight, right? Faith without works is dead. Six, pray, 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 pray to have these defects of character removed. I mean, there's some awesome like stuff out there. There's, all, there's more columns, your liabilities, your assets make me more, dear Lord, make me more selfless, make me less selfish. God, make me more honest, make me less of a liar. God, make me more generous and less of a miser. God, give me more patience and let me be less erratic. And, and, and yeah, I think that was a good word. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Seven, God, I'm still pretty messed up, right? Nothing in my life, if you're going through this quickly, I, I called myself a recovered alcoholic about six months after my last drink. So I'm in this, pro I'm in step six or seven, I don't know, four months after. Trust and believe 
my life is not great. I'm still unemployed. I'm still not, I'm still essentially like I'm kind of fundamentally homeless. I have nowhere to go. I'm still mentally like a mess. I'm medically torn apart. I'm emotionally distraught. Nothing is going well except this really strong belief that God has got my back. So I ask God, help me remove the remainder of my shortcomings. FYI, when it says a design for living that really works, and when I say we do need to be brainwashed, it's because these problems won't go away just because alcohol gets removed depression and anxiety and lying and cheating and manipulation and stealing and whatever else, lack of patience and selfishness will all rear their ugly heads. But we are being taught how to live a different way for the rest of our lives. Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing to do with alcohol and very little is very little to do with with recovery from actually alcohol. Right now, that's a kind of a harsh statement. It's It's a loaded statement. It's about allowing God into your life so that you can live according to his will. He says that you can be unblocked and be the person that you're designed to be. We definitely can't drink, but drinking is so like, you know, I don't know the numbers, but like, do, how many times does this book say God versus alcohol? It's very, it's astonishing, right? <laughs> Number eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and become willing to make amends to them. And again, it says, you know, faith without works is dead. (laughs) That list is already done. We made it when we did our inventory. So you've got these, like, you know, you got these people, places, and institutions. Or or ideas, forget the wrong list, right? You've got this list. And number eight was kind of, for me, it was an... A, a prioritization list. I've got these resentments and fears and harms, and I've got these individuals, and I've got these institutions, and I need to make an amends. I need to make wrong. So I need to correct this harm. I need to be willing to make the amends. Right. The word become willing and the word ask comes up so often in our program. You pray, dear Lord, dear God. You know, give me the strength to write this letter to this person who I stole from. Dear God, give me the courage to have a conversation with a person that I harmed. Dear God, please place that person in my life when you see fit so that I can come correct and do the right thing. So for me, it was like, I think I wrote this list of like, now, later, <laughs> maybe, and never. And the, uh, the, the alcoholic wants to put everybody in like the maybe and the never list, but we have to be, it, it says in step five, actually, that the rule is to be hard on ourselves and easy on others. And so, you know, stay away from the maybe and the, and the never list, but I think I made those up myself. So, um, so you just, it's a priority thing. Who are you going to do this to? And it was also a pl- it was prioritization and planning. I mean, I, I again, somebody should walk you through this, man. And, and like I had these like index cards, or like I had this little planner thing that I created. Because by this time, like my brain is no longer foggy. I'm no longer jittery. I'm no longer in a daze. I, like my brain is starting to work again. And I was like, when am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? What's the harm? What's the amends? Cleaning my side of the street, become willing. What's the prayer? When am I going to do this? Make the phone call, send the text, write the letter, make it happen. Faith without works is dead. And then we get to step number nine. You know, I could tell you so much about like my actual amends, uh, but I will tell you that most of them turn out bad because people, at least from my experience, 
They didn't want to talk to me anymore. They didn't want to hear from me anymore. They didn't want to hear the excuses. But, but for all the bad ones, the ones that become glorious and show you how great the program of AA is, how great the, the process is, will make up for them. To amend means to correct, to repair, to strengthen, to make better. It tells us that, uh, you know, a, a, a mumbling of the word I'm sorry is not sufficient. We probably said I'm sorry forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Right? It's like the most, you know, most commonly used words in our vocabulary. To amend is to apologize. To amend is to seek forgiveness. To amend is to never do again. That's a tough, that's a high standard that we want to hold ourselves to. And that's an amends process. And that will set you free. I, I do, like, I got seven minutes, 40 seconds left. I'm on step nine, about step six, step 10. I want to quit, tell you a quick story about, uh, I guess I'll just, whatever, when, when, right? So I was, I had this apartment and uh, I essentially, I was, I had rented out this room to this person and uh, I was overcharging this person. And then I eventually like moved out of the apartment, but I kept the apartment and I, I said, you can take the whole apartment and I overcharged her even more. And I moved somewhere else and I was making money on the apartment and I was using the money for what? <laughs> what do you think I was using it for? Drugs and alcohol. And like, I wasn't paying the rent and the, the, the poor person was like getting like these eviction notices. And then I'd be like, oh, oh, I got that. Don't worry about it. And I would like pay. But the eviction notices would like constantly show up because I was getting this check and my my sick, twisted mind would be like, oh, this is this is a good weekend right here. Like, let's go. Eventually, this person was fed up, you know, totally harmed and traumatized, moved out. Of course, I got a resentment against this person for moving out and not giving me money anymore, right? Um, you know, I keep her security deposit because I'm like, oh, how dare you, like, leave? Like, oh, you didn't give me 30 days notice. I swear, I tell you no lies. <laughs> and then, like, the woman, the woman continued to get... Uh, like mail there and it's from like a financial institution and and my my sick twisted brain went straight to i'm gonna see if i can like maybe i can like steal this person's identity feel steal like their like financial records like steal their money no seriously and i opened it up with the intention of like trying to figure out a way to like rob this person no uh, so what was there was their new mailing address and something in my sweet because we're good people something in my heart said keep this i just kept this like letter of where the new address was and when it came to the times for amends i reached out to this person email again i don't want anything to do with you i tried to understand your behavior it was i couldn't understand it i want you know i want this to be set i don't want anything to do with you I said, okay. I wrote the check. I put the check in an envelope and I mailed it to that address that I found on that letter, which I initially thought I was going to like steal her financial life. Nothing. Heard nothing. I right? didn't even remember about it until one day I get an email and I got an email from that person who was living back who had moved back to Taiwan. This person, by the way, was in New York and seminary school, learned training to be a pastor. But this is where God, this is how good, good God is. This is how good God is. And that email essentially says, I've received your check, you know, through God's grace. And uh, essentially, you know, like I explained to her what happened, why I was doing it, like what the book tells me to do. This is what happened to me. This is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm seeking your forgiveness and your amends. And I sent that check to like, you know, a, an address in Manhattan, New York City, and it ended up in Taiwan. And that woman became a, a friend 
That woman be, sent me a Christmas card that year. Like, I repaired that damage. But just think about how that check ended up in Taiwan, man. Come on. Is that God or is, it, is that odd or is that God? That is, that is God. And then we keep going. So look, I mean, I'm at three minutes, 36 seconds here. And step 10 says, continue to take personal inventory. When we were wrong, you know, we promptly admitted it. You know, when fear crops up, right, we watch for selfishness, resentment, right, fear, dishonesty. When these things crop up, selfishness, dishonesty, fear, and resentment. We ask ourselves, uh, you know, if you know anything about the four absolutes, the, the Oxford movement, which was the precursor of the 12 steps, where all this co stuff kind of comes from, right? Are your actions pure? Are they loving? Are they unselfish? Are they kind? It's really hard, but it's like, this is where we have to live. We live in this place of, I've got to hold myself to this high esteem because I am living according to God's will. And God's will is not a, a fall down, black down drunk. It was never his will, but he gives us the he gives us our own will to make the decisions so that he can correct us later. It's a little little wonky, but it's what it is. It's just what it is, man. And so that's step 10. And it's like you're just constantly thinking about everything that you've done. Step 10 is essentially running through four, four through nine over and over and over on a daily basis. Because you don't want to ever get to a place where you're so um, kind of compacted with your fears and your resentments and your harms that you become blocked off from the sunlight of the spirit. And at that point, you drink and you drug. And step 11 says to us, and what does it say? What does it say? It says, continue, no, sorry, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying only for knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. Now, this is powerful stuff. You know, if you just hang out in this book, great. If you, if it's like it says, like seek other spiritual help from your rabbi, your pastor, your minister, there are other helpful books as well. Even better. Seek your spiritual path. Seek to grow, enlighten and grow your spiritual world. Right? It tells us over and over. By the way, there's tons of promises, right? But there's lots of premonitions. He goes, he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. Does that ring a bell? He failed to enlarge his spiritual life. And he was drunk and dead. You know, we are blessed human beings. Blessed. We've got to stay in the sunlight of the spirit. We will fall. I fall. I fall daily. I fall daily. But I stay there. I stay in the place of trying to figure out what is God's will for me? Who does God want the Unices to be? And am I, am I, am I attempting, am I meeting that mark? That's where I've got to be. And in step 12, it tells us to give this away. So I don't know if I could put my number in the chat at this point. Oh, I just did. I think I think I went to the group. Yeah. I, I, I'm not, I, I, you know what, I mean, I'm an educator. I spent like two years on the internet, like doing Zoom all over the place. So like, but I've actually never uh, sponsored anyone on Zoom. It's not my preference, but, I, but I'm putting it out there that I'm willing to help for fun and for free. Uh, and, you know, it tells us that, you know, the best way, to the, you know what the best defense uh, grants us immunity from drinking is service to others especially alcoholics but it's service to others and this is why i'm like super blessed a a fall down blackout got fired school teacher who became an assistant principal and i'm sure god is going to make me a principal soon because god's got plans for us and the the drinking and the drugging the way that we did it was not the plan. It'd be great if uh, 
it'd be great if we could drink normally, right? I mean, that'd be great. I can't. You know, I mean, I'll, you know, jokingly, like if I could stay at a three drink buzz like my whole life, that's where I'd stay, man. Are you kidding me? But I can't. So I don't. And so that's that's the message, man. With 45 seconds left, it's it's the same message as Dr. Bob, right? It's like trust God, clean house, help others. Find someone who is talking about the book, the, the book, the steps, and God, because that is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And don't water it down. Share, express and share the spiritual feature freely. Tell people exactly what happened to you. And that's exactly what this book says. It says, this is how people found, sought, found, and formed their own relationship with God. It doesn't say how people stop drinking. All right. Love you guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.